All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, afternoon session. Um, for those of you who are coming in, please feel free to, to take a seat. We'll be talking about scalability and consensus. So the first speaker is going to be Dahlia Markey, who is the Chief uh, Research Officer at Chainlink. And she is going to be talking about maximum extractable value protection on a DAG. So with that, um, it's great to have you, and we very much look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Two, two slides that are the least uh, favorite, one just before lunch and just uh, and one right after lunch. I try to keep you awake, and I'll talk about uh, MEV on a DAG. And what this talk does is puts two known advances, or two recently known advances uh, in this technology and puts them together. So what are these two advances? One is advances in the performance and the throughput of Byzantine fault tolerant or BFT consensus methods, especially ones uh, relying on a substrate uh, which is causally and totally ordered uh, uh, and uh, creates a direct cyclic graph uh, transport or a DAG. And the other one are um, mitigation approaches and strategies for um, protecting against MEV. And the point is, and this is part of a kind of a larger agenda is what, that when you look at the technology, it's really the weakest link or the slowest link that is gonna determine the, uh, the performance. So it doesn't matter if you have this really, really, really fast uh, consensus, BFT consensus engine, uh, but there's some uh, component of the system which slows you down, um, uh, it won't help you. You're using the wrong technology uh, to drive performance. And you'd be like this poor uh, guy trying to um, cart square instead, instead of cartwheel, uh, you know, uh, up a hill. So let's start with um, recent advances in the performance, the throughput of BFT consensus uh, uh, systems. How many people in the audience here are uh, purely applied cryptography and don't know much about consensus uh, and BFT? Not many. How many are the other way around? They know a lot about consensus and uh, uh, not about cryptography. And the rest are, oh, I just had lunch. What do you want from me? OK, so let's, let's do a very, very quick um, uh, historical uh, review uh, of uh, this quest, which is really a four decade long quest to bring up performance throughput of BFT consensus engines. So it started with a seminal work by uh, Dwan Lynch Stockmeyer, 94, who uh, instead of uh, using randomization or other techniques to uh, uh, solve uh, consensus, focused on the steady state where most of the time you can just have a leader drive consensus and then there's no problem with consensus. Everybody just listens to the leader. And the only problem is to keep, to keep uh, the system consistent and safe uh, between times when uh, leaders are stable and drive progress. And this was the partial synchrony model and they showed the first deterministic consensus under these settings and really broke new ground. Um, a decade uh, after that, the community has mostly focused on these group communication substrates that uh, we're building the transport as efficiently and as uh, high throughput as possible. I actually gained my PhD during that uh, decade, also uh, writing a thesis about you know, these group commu communication, peer-based systems that we're using, first of all, reliable communication and then building gradually more and more semantics into it. Unfortunately, this decade kind of was killed, slaughtered by a paper by uh, Cheriton and uh, Skin uh, called causally or understanding the limitations of causally and totally ordered communication. And after they wrote this paper, essentially the community, community pivoted away uh, from causally, totally ordered communication. They said, what the hell is it good for? And for about two decades after that, uh, starting with um, uh, the first practical Byzantine consensus um, solution by Castro and Liskov, the community focused on pure consensus protocols in, you know, in this partial synchrony model. And Castro and Liskov introduced a very practical protocol, uh, but it did have quadratic com communication complexity. It didn't bother us in 1999. Systems had you know, four, maybe seven nodes, uh, so N-squared communication wasn't such a big deal, but both from a theoretical curiosity point of view and because uh, you know, people were uh, starting to think about scaling systems, the quest has been, can we drive this quadratic communication complexity of BFT consensus down? And 
Um, the answer uh, was uh, positive. There are a lot of advances, a lot of steps, and in some, in some sense, the, the, this culminated in a work that I and my co-authors introduced in 2019 called Hot Stuff, which linearized all the steps of the protocol. Linearized means you arrive at consensus, all you need to do is essentially pay no more than disseminating what the consensus is. Clearly, that's the minimum you can possibly hope for. If we're all agreeing on even a single bit, zero or one, at the very least, we should all know that bit. So at the very least, we have to pay linear communication. Turns out that you can actually solve consensus with that complexity. So history done, but wait, no DAG, no causally ordered, what's going on? So at this point, we scaled up as a community consensus as far as we can go. What do you do when you cannot scale up anymore? You scale out. And so this notion of uh, solving consensus while having many, many parallel proposals going on simultaneously and scaling out uh, re-emerged. And uh, in a number of works over the past five, uh, six years, uh, starting with um, Hashgraph and then through uh, a number of systems, uh, as well as academic papers, uh, people have shown um, and improved, you know, have shown remarkable uh, performance and uh, uh, very elegant designs. And through better engineering, uh, one of the uh, uh, most recent uh, advances in the field uh, was a system called Narwhal, Narwhal, Narwhal and Tusk, which built consensus over um, uh, a DAG or over a causally uh, and reliably uh, 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 consistent uh, communication substrate. Um, and I'm encountering the same difficulty that others did. So this was the first part. This is, okay, recent advances, getting great performance and great throughput in consensus. Um, the second advance is uh, people have, first of all, flagged and realized that um, um, transactions, uh, transaction tr transparency on a blockchain makes them vulnerable to arbitrage uh, opportunities. So front running, sandwich attacks, all sorts of opportunities when somebody sees a transaction being submitted and they know that it will drive the price uh, of a certain uh, digital asset up or down, uh, because everything is transparent, they're able to front run it, they're able to sandwich it with all sorts of attacks and essentially uh, extract value out of knowing which transactions are pending. And so they defied in a paper in 2020 called Flash Boys, uh, MEV, the maximal extractable uh, uh, value, uh, as the profit that can be made through including, excluding, or reordering transactions within blocks. Um, now the same crowd that introduced this threat has also worked on mechanisms that actually exploit it. And uh, if you look at uh, um, uh, MEV Explorer, a tool that currently looks at how much value was, uh, has been extracted, and this is a very cautious estimate. It only, only looks at uh, ETH to dollar uh, uh, transactions in a very, very uh, conservative way estimates how much value was extracted. Uh, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, accumulated uh, until now. And in the past month, since uh, uh, ETH merge, uh, if you look at the, the uh, chart on the bottom, uh, people are analyzing how many blocks on proof of stake Ethereum are actually being uh, uh, generated and, and uh, uh, crafted by MEV block builders or block builders that are extracting uh, value. And it's staggering. Within less than uh, you know, a few weeks, less than a couple of months, uh, it climbed up to 50, uh, close to 50%. So half of the blocks on Ethereum right now are subject to some kind of MEV by these tools. Um, I'm not gonna um, try to form an opinion here. Uh, there's all sorts of religions or whether MEV uh, is good, driving uh, you know, efficiency in, in a market or it is bad. But one thing is very clear, it is the number one cause right now and the number one threat uh, in uh, uh, proof of stake Ethereum um, that drives centralization. So only very powerful, very capable, uh, computationally uh, uh, capable uh, block producers uh, compete for being able to extract value. And um, it's a market uh, that is inefficient and drives uh, uh, you know, through economy of scale uh, centralization. So if you don't like centralization, you, don't, you probably uh, wanna look for ways uh, to uh, 
uh, mitigate this. And there may be other reasons like stability, fairness, or other, other reasons you may care about it. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not gonna opine either way. However, if you do want to protect against it, the question is what do you do? And so in this talk, I wanna focus on one particular mechanism, which is blind um, uh, ordering or committing to the ordering of transactions without seeing transactions in the clear, committing to a blind ordering and only after that opening it. This is uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, most immediate uh, mitigation strategies you can employ, and it's pretty dar darn effective. But the question is, um, uh, how do you implement it uh, at the throughputs of you know, uh, BFT, uh, blockchains, BFT consensus mechanisms like the ones that are being developed on DAGs? And so this is what this talk is about, putting uh, the two of them together. Uh, and so in the time that I have left, uh, in the 10 minutes, maybe less that I have left, I want to very, very quickly talk about a framework for embedding blind ordering in BFT consensus engines, and then how to make it efficient to meet the throughputs of you know, these recent advances. There's one, two, three. Let's see if I can do it in 10 minutes. Stop me when I'm, uh, you know, however long I get. How much do I have? Five minutes? Ah, should work. Okay, so the framework is, uh, the idea is very simple. Let's use threshold uh, mechanisms where uh, a user will send a transaction encrypted Transaction TX uh, uh, encrypted with TX key, such that it requires F plus one uh, out of three F plus one to open it, but you can always open it uh, with two F plus one. So this is the dispersal phase. Um, then after transactions are committed to the total ordering blindly, uh, then you can retrieve the shares of the transactions and open them, such that you can reconstruct in a deterministic way and a guaranteed outcome. Um, and in a consensus mechanism, we want to operate it view by view so that the next view uh, cannot even start and cannot run forward before uh, all the transactions of the previous view, the ones that were committed already, are opened. And this way we guarantee um, that clients can have the latest uh, state uh, to uh, submit transactions uh, based on. And um, what are the requirements from this framework? So whenever uh, a user sends transactions and shares the key with the nodes in the system, uh, it should be hiding. The transaction should not be um, um, uh, known. It should be binding such that as soon as it's delivered, um, the outcome has been determined. So it's not subject to MEV itself uh, because what an attacker can do is it can see uh, you know, what, what order has been committed, uh, maybe I shouldn't allow opening it, maybe there's more than one uh, way to open uh, the transaction. No, that should be deterministic. And uh, if the user was honest and was sharing uh, correctly, um, then we should open the transactions of the user. What's important is also what is not a requirement, because threshold secret sharing mechanisms are well, well known in the uh, uh, literature. But what is not a requirement is we don't require that any, every node will be able to recover the transactions. We have a consensus mechanism that takes care of progress. We don't require successfully reconstructing the secret. If the user sent, uh, shared incorrectly the key for encrypting a transaction, it's fine to reject that transaction, so long as the outcome is unique, uh, rejection is a, is a perfectly legitimate outcome. And we don't need to compute with a secret while keeping it a secret. As soon as we, uh, the transaction is committed, we open it. So it's a much, much weaker problem than usual threshold cryptography mechanisms. And to implement it, there are a number of sort of obvious candidates, but one that I particularly want to highlight. One obvious candidate is threshold encryption. Um, through a setup, everybody shares uh, the uh, uh, secret uh, key uh, between a public and uh, private uh, key pair. And then uh, a user can encrypt the transaction such that F plus one are needed to decrypt it. The problem with threshold encryption is that it takes orders of hundreds of milliseconds. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it takes orders of milliseconds, hundreds of microseconds, uh, or something like three uh, milliseconds in a fairly small system to reconstruct uh, uh, a transaction, and that already caps the throughput at you know a few hundred transactions per second. So we're not going to be able to drive high throughput with threshold encryption. Another obvious candidate is secret sharing, but we need to uh, employ verifiable secret sharing because every subset of 
retrieve chairs need to yield the same outcome. And that again uses non-trivial, that's my timer, non-trivial uh, cryptography and uh, takes time. So an approach that I want to uh, underscore is uh, one that was recently introduced by Dispersed Ledger called Avid M, where the idea is that you commit to a Merkle tree of all the trees, and then after you reconstruct, you can regenerate the Merkle tree and thereby guarantee that the sharing was correct. So you don't do it during disperse, you do it during uh, reconstruct. Uh, so um, uh, this works very fast and uh, is very efficient. And I wish I can, uh, uh, and there are also hybrid approaches. So putting all of this framework uh, into a DAG-based consensus is something that I won't have time to talk about, but let me just mention that uh, we've introduced a, an extremely simple um, BFT consensus mechanism on DAG that, there we go, that um, cleanly separates between, okay, you have a reliable, causally ordered uh, uh, communication substrate, and you can build BFT consensus on top of it, and we call our uh, algorithm FINO, um, with uh, no requirements on the DAG. The, DAG. the DAG doesn't need to be layered. You don't have to wait for a particular number of predecessors before you can uh, send another broadcast. You don't need to wait for consensus uh, uh, steps or timeouts or uh, any kind of logic. It's uh, completely separated. And on this, scrolling to the end, um, you can efficiently uh, employ this blind ordering on a DAG. And what you can get uh, as a result of this is uh, all parts of the system are moving at the same throughput. You don't have any bottlenecks. Um, uh, and you avoid any of the uh, uh, hard, uh, you know, uh, costly crypto mechanisms like threshold encryption or VSS. You simply use Merkle tree uh, commitments and uh, verify it after the fact. And my last sentence will be, um, I think that in generally, uh, there are a lot of components now uh, in systems and making sure that they all combine and you, you're not bottlenecked at the slowest one is really uh, generally a really good uh, uh, direction for the community to work. And I'm done. And I don't know if you have questions or we're going to... Hi, Dalia. Yeah. So just uh, the, the old question, is, it, uh, is the algorithm relying on the DAG data structure in nature at all, or it doesn't really matter? It can be applied to a linear chain-based uh, data structure as well. So the fast answer is the framework is uh, something that you can generally embed in any, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what linear means, but uh, in any BFT consensus. The DAG makes it, makes it much, much simpler. You don't have to uh, say what you're proposing, it's just there in the DAG. You don't have to uh, 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 worry about uh, do everybody know what the committed decision is because everybody interprets uh, the DAG locally. And everybody can agree and see on the DAG uh, whether shares were retrieved and thereby enable the next view. So the DAG makes it uh, very uh, uh, elegant. But the main thing that the DAG gives you is generally it's the recent advances and it's the highest throughput uh, consensus that there are around. Does that answer? Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again.